Welcome to Card Players The Circuit with your hosts, the Donkey, the Cub, and the Caveman. That's right, everyone. You are listening to CardPlayer.com's The Circuit. We are broadcasting on Sports Byline Radio on Sirius Channel 122 on CardPlayer.com and on the iTunes Music Store as a podcast. Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach, this is your 2006 World Series of Poker main event final table preview show. But we also have interviews. We have all kinds of goodies today. We do not have hand of the day. We do not. We do not have phone calls. We do not. We do not have poker talk with Big G and the Baby Kangaroo. We do not. We do not have emails. None. We do have Steve Zolotow and David Gray handicapping the final table, and we're also going to interview them. Yeah, we are. Those guys are like genius wrapped inside of like total just brains and all kinds of like cottage yeah. cheese and it's good stuff. I don't they're, I don't even know what that means, but I do know. Go ahead. They're really smart. They're, they're, smart they're very guys. smart. They have a ton of, of history at the World Series of Poker, so they're going to bring a, lo- a very unique perspective to this Final Table Preview show. And if I'm not mistaken, this will be the most bald men we've ever had on the show at one time. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And I was balding, but now I take a little octagonal orange pill that keeps me from losing my hair. Do you? That's right. That's Everyone awesome. in the entire world. Very, very interesting. And we are still at the Bellagio, by the way, in the Fontana Bar, and there are now 13 players left for the Bellagio Cup 2 main event. One of them recently shaved his head, and his name is Men the Master Win. I don't like the shaved head look. It's like he's trying to rock like gangster. Why did he do that? It's not. I don't know, but I think it looks a little silly. Personally. I don't like it either. All you can eat, baby. <laughs> I don't remember what his uh, his hair used to look like he looked, he looked like a normal older gentleman. Older gentlemen do not just go like, yo, what's up? I'm going to get gangster on y'all men, well, bitch. You see, what you, you got? see all of his new gear, too? The new yeah, Men the Master he's gone stuff? Like, he's gone like fully Hollywood, dude. Full on Hollywood. Full Hollywood. He also has full-on monster chips right now. Is there anyone else notable left in this field? Uh, we, oh, uh, Johan Stor- Stor- Yeah. You know how you're, how you're actually Min, supposed to say his last name? Min Stokish. Stokish. Uh, Min, that guy, Min that Win, too, who's uh, got a ton of chips. He's going to be tough. Who? Min? Min Win. Yeah. Min Poker oh, Host yeah, Win? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Min Poker Host Win. All right. Looks like Steve Zolotow and David Gray are here right now. Listen to Fontana Bar. Let's get them sat down here. Bring it. David and Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. What's up, boys? I hate much. I hate to kick it off this way, but I, I would like to know how the World Series went for each of you. We could start with, uh, I guess we'll go from right to left with uh, David. How the World Series this year go? Well, it was a tough fight for me this year. Uh, I got down deep in two or three tournaments. Twice I finished just out of the money. Once I came in like 14th in the 5,000 stud and ended up getting destroyed. <laughs> it wasn't a good series for me. Getting uh, a lot of time wasted that I could have uh, better spent uh, reading books and playing side games. Dang, I wish you'd gone to the movies. How many events something? did you play? I mean, come on. I, fortunately for me, I only fanned in about eight or nine events. Oh, I okay. didn't play that many. I didn't play 40. Right. I How played, about, the, a, played I about eight or nine. I played 40. <laughs> How about the main event? The main event. Uh, How long did you last there? I, la- I came about a thousandth, I guess, about a hundred out of the money. Oh, really? That's wow. easy. I mean, that's painful. Oh, but what a player I yeah. was. <laughs> well, well, what about, so, but I mean, having been around there then, how many days was that that you lasted? That was early. That in, it took a week to go broke, but it was actually my right. third day of playing. So, so it was about an hour and a half into the third day. So what was your uh, high point in chips? Uh, 10,000. No. <laughs> I had. You, uh, can, you can write a short stack like I've never <laughs> seen. I, I might have had 70 at one time. Yeah. What was your perception of the play then, having lasted three days and seeing all the crazy things that probably went on? We've heard a lot of crazy play from people who have come in here. What, what did you think about the players overall? Well, the tables I were at were, they weren't really playing completely crazy. Some of the tables were playing exceptionally tight. Sometimes there was times where five or six people would call and take the flops. And there was a lot of big hands. And it was hard to really tell you know, not seeing everyone's whole cards, how exactly they were playing. But, I mean, there were obviously some very inexperienced players that, you know, if they flopped the top pair and someone bet enough to break them, they were broke if it was a beat. But uh, there were a lot of people have improved their play. It's a tougher to beat people you never saw anymore because uh, either I'm getting worse or they're getting better. <laughs> so, Steve, how about you? How did the World Series go this year? Well, about the same as it went for David. You know, I describe the same thing except I played in more tournaments and my tears are going to ruin your microphone here get it all (laughs) wet and salty Um, continuing with what David said I think a lot of the good unknown players have a big advantage because those of us who've been around and are known people have some idea how we play some of the people who come in from the internet can be very very strong technically You've never seen their face before. They handle chips like they just fell off the turnip truck, and you think, well, this guy can't know what he's doing. And 
You know, basically, he doesn't make a no limit disastrous mistake. He might be a little off, but they're playing very strong, some of them. So you've obviously been around poker for a while. Um, can you kind of give us uh, how you started off in the game, how you picked up poker, and uh, sort of your poker history, if you will? Uh, well, initially I wanted to be an actor, and I dropped out of Columbia to study acting, and I couldn't support myself acting. I didn't want to be a cab driver or a bartender, and I drifted into gambling, which is something I'd always done with my family. I was playing small stake poker first in New York City, then in California, in those days the legal place in California was Gardena, and the game was draw, so I played baby draw poker for years to try and make ends meet. I had a lot of bad habits, uh, and then eventually I got back to New York, got away from my bad habits, finished school, had a job, then uh, I quit my job as soon as I got my MBA and went back to gambling full-time. First backgammon, then sports, and last 10, 15 years or so, mostly poker. How about you, David? Well, I did everything Steve did without any of the stops. <laughs> I went straight from high school to the racetrack. No breaks. <laughs> I went to Columbia for one day. That was enough for me to realize that I was not cut out for Columbia. And I uh, withdrew after the first day. One day? Uh, one day. What exactly yeah, happened there that you knew it, w it wasn't for you some in one day? I think well, some I went big to kid stole his lunch. <laughs> no. You got stuffed Columbia. in your locker. Be I uh, actually went to two classes. Each one was in the large lectern hall with a professor, graduate assistants, and course outlines. And after like their first hour of telling me what I was required to do per night, I immediately packed up my things because I went through my four years of high school studying for about four hours in four years. Yeah. <laughs> and now it looked like it was four or five hours a night right. of reading and outlines and reports and paperwork. And that didn't look fun to me. And I wasn't ready for that. So I actually withdrew. I went uh, home and told my father, by the way, I withdrew. And he said, okay, Mr. Genius, what are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe I'll travel or I didn't even get the or out of my mouth. And he told me to get in my car and go to either, I lived on Long Island at the time, either CW Post or Hofstra or Adelphi and register today <laughs> for school. And a friend of mine had graduated a half a year early and was going to post, and I had been out there, so I said, I'll go to post, at which I went to the registration's office. The only question they really wanted to know from me was, did I require financial aid? They didn't even want to know if I could read. <laughs> so I enrolled. I went to school there for a year and a half. The first year, doing okay. The second year... I tied the world record for UWs, which is unauthorized withdrawals, five for five. <laughs> and so I have a question for. You. And I was going to the racetrack every night and okay. playing cards during the day. You answer my question. <laughs> in the harness racing, and basically, I was I graduated high school when I was seventeen, so I was only eighteen when I was going to the racetrack six nights a week, playing poker five or six days a week, mm -hmm. with some Las Vegas nights after the racetrack until three or four in the morning, and some Atlantic City trips interspersed in between. So I really didn't have much time to do anything but gamble, sleep and eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's basically what I did from when I was 18 until I was uh, 25 when I moved to Las Vegas wow. in 1984. What were the games that you were playing uh, back then when you were saying you were playing five, six nights a week during your... Well, your I was going years? to the racetrack five or six, six nights a week. I was playing poker in the daytime in this drugstore in Forest Hills where I first met Steve some 25 years ago. Wow. And we used to play with a collection of bookmakers, sports bettors, couple racetrack guys and stuff all knock around guys there was a group of 13 14 guys every day anywhere between 6 and 12 of them would show up and play poker from like 12 30 in the afternoon to like 5 30 which then the bookmaker factions had to go to their bookmaking office the racetrack factions had to go to their <laughs> racetrack places and i don't even know where the other guys went one guy owned the fish store next door so he went uh he went fishing went, no he, he actually <laughs> went to to his restaurant next door to uh take care of his customers and stuff like that so it was like a never-ending it was like from poker right to go home take a quick shower drive out to the racetrack you're at the racetrack from eight o'clock until eleven thirty. then what are you going to do is there going to be a late night chinese poker game is there going to be go to the las vegas night are you going to go to chinatown and get something to eat and there was like having a little time to chase girls here and there it kind of sounds like summer camp for gamblers it was <laughs> what it, it was like basically not something I would recommend, but it was a very fun <laughs> you, period you in, in my life. I mean, I, I don't think many people could survive it. Right. But uh, I did somehow. 
and then I came to Vegas some 22 years ago, and mm-hmm. I've been here ever since. Although I do go to sleep a lot earlier now, believe it or not, than I did when I was <laughs> running around doing all those things. So, Steve, you were you were in this drugstore game as well? Is that well, I, I had already started betting sports very actively then, and I was just becoming a winning player in the sports betting. And some of the bookmakers were sort of out for revenge, and they figured, well, he's a sports better. He can't know anything about poker. And occasionally they dragged me off to a poker game, and... I probably had a bigger edge over these guys at poker than I did at anything else because most of them were... Oh, yeah, we were bad yeah. back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, was, I was one of the better ones, and I was pretty bad. Looking back on how I played then compared to now, you know, it was, uh, you know, Mickey Appleman came with Steve sometimes and played, and Mickey was so yeah. far superior to us 20-something years ago. Yeah. He may still be superior yeah. to us, but he was so far superior to us back then, it was, it was almost really like a, a man playing with, like, children just right. taking their lunch money every day. <laughs> Although in poker, of course, you can't win every day, but he had a tremendous advantage. And then Mike Schickman was another experienced player that Steve had played with in New York City mm-hmm. that uh, also played in the drugstore game that all still are playing poker 30 years later. We played with guys that didn't think it was necessary to look at your cards until maybe the fifth or sixth card because you're going to play anyways no matter what you have. Like in <laughs> Omaha, who knows what they're going to put on the flop, so you may as well just take the flop. Right. <laughs> There's plenty of those guys still around, I think. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Of them's at yeah one of them is Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I play like that most of the time. It was, it was an interesting time. I mean, I, th- I shudder to think what I could have done to those games if I knew then what I know now. I mean, I won anyways because I was slightly sharper than my other idiot friends at the time when I was young and impetuous. But compared to what I know I, today... I don't know what impetuous means. <laughs> that means people that couldn't sit still and wait to fold. <laughs> they were ready to rock and roll on every hand. Well, one of the other things about these games was the spirit of the game was you had to gamble. If you just came and sat and waited and waited and waited for a good hand, you wouldn't be invited back. Mm-hmm. So you had to give action to get action or to get invitations. Or you had to appear to give action anyways. Yeah. I mean, Steve was, was very good at appearances. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were mentioned that you came out to, to Vegas and you had started being around the series, you said, back in the 70s. I was wondering if you give us basically like uh, a World Series of Poker history lesson in Steve Z's words of, of how things have changed from now to then and any interesting stories you may have uh, from back in the day, as they say, as the kids say. Well, I know I first started coming out here when I was still working a day job, and I think I made... 30000 a year and took home 20000 They didn't have satellites then, and there was no way in the world I was going to plunk down 10000 to play in a big poker tournament. I mostly played cash games with, like, $1,000 buy-ins, and I was ecstatic when I won $5,000. And maybe three, four years later, they started a few satellites, and then they just took over everything. And uh, I would finally got in through some satellites and started playing some main events. By then also, I'd quit work and was more prosperous. And the World Series used to be earlier in the year, so the basketball playoffs were on at the same time. And winning a poker tournament was worth maybe 50000 Not the main event, but winning a little poker tournament was worth 50000 And I was betting 25 or 30 on a basketball game, so I'd much rather watch the basketball, bet the half times, and have some fun, and uh, then drift into the cash games after that. So... You had the 1995 uh, Chinese poker uh, bracelet. They don't even have that game anymore at the World Series. They have a he lot was of too games good. They had to retire it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell us? That you, you were telling me beforehand that there was an interesting story behind well, that as well, behind well, the Chinese the, poker there championship. There are a couple of them. David and the drugstore people were the ones who uncovered Chinese poker. I think they went to a Chinese restaurant in, and saw in the... In Flushing, they used to play Chinese poker in the back of this restaurant called Lums on Main Street in Flushing in Queens in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And evidently, now, when I moved out to Las Vegas and I met, like, Johnny Chan, and someone said something about Chinese poker, and he looked at me like a little white Jewish kid from New York. You, you know Chinese poker? You know 13-card poker? <laughs> and so I played Johnny Chan. He came over to my house, and we played for, what, a couple hundred dollars a point or something, or a hundred dollars a point, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. Right. And I won, like, two or three thousand from him after a while, and he couldn't believe that, like, a, a white guy could beat him, you know? <laughs> it was like, he'd never seen a white guy even play before, because he grew up, you know, in Hong Kong, playing this game when he was five years old. You know, he, I still think that Johnny doesn't believe that a white guy can beat him <laughs> at anything. It might be true. He doesn't, but, but I think he's figured out that they could beat him some of the time. Right. Well, one of the <laughs> things, uh, you know, you were asking about Doyle's book. I wrote a section saying, don't specialize in one game, play everything. That, you know, knowing Chinese poker, having that in your repertoire, suddenly you meet somebody 
somebody and he says, oh, well, let's kill time on the airplane, mm -hmm. and you happen to be an accomplished Chinese poker player, you can uh, pay for your flight plus a lot of uh, extra time, you know, traveling around. And uh, I think it's very good to be good at as many games as you can. Right. The Chinese poker bracelet that I won, I played Doyle Brunson in the finals, and we played heads up from about midnight until five in the morning. And the two of us were the only people left in the casino. And one very drunk guy who'd bet $10 on me. And whenever I went a hand, he'd yell, Z, Z, go get him. <laughs> and it was a really angering Doyle. <laughs> so that game is a game that, uh, that people say is, pretty, is a pretty mechanical game. Where does the skill and the edge come in for people who you say well, are an accomplished it's, it's, Chinese it, poker player? What does a, that mean? It's a card arrangement game. The big skill difference is not overlooking anything. The minuscule skill differences are knowing, let's say, how to play two pair. Do you put two pair in the middle and high cards up front, or do you split your two pair? Things like that. But most of it, most of the skill at the, for really beating somebody for a lot is just not to overlook things. Or getting mm. a lot of royalties. Ro and royalties we hadn't help. talked about that on the show last night. Or did you mention royalties? On the <laughs> I show mentioned last it night? on the show. You okay. get some royalties, you can beat anyone. Right. You get enough of them. I'm good at getting royalties. <laughs> <laughs> that would just go along with the You have a royal air about you, Gavin. <laughs> Indeed. Are you a prince? Be honest. Yes. Good. <laughs> well, David, uh, speaking of moments throughout the World Series of, of Poker, obviously probably at this point maybe what has become the biggest moment in World Series of Poker history, Chris Moneymaker's win in 2003. You were right there to, to witness the whole thing. And, in fact, I think you mentioned he knocked you out. He did, that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think back on that year when you were you guys were all a part of it and, and, and you're there at the final table, did you sense some sort of changing of the tide, so to speak, when, when this was all going on? I mean, the, it was already the biggest tournament in history. At 8:39, and then you have a guy who satellite his way in online, which was kind of a new thing. I mean, how were you? Well, of course, nobody knew Chris at the time, right. and he wasn't with 20 players left or something. It was like there's this guy. It happened to be, probably will never happen again. The quality and caliber of players that made it to the final right. table that year. There was five or six top pros, and Phil Ivey finished tenth as well. Right, right. So there was you know Jason, Amir Vahidi, Sammy Farhar. I was there at Dan Harrington. Uh, I mean, it was an incredible final table of strength as far as accomplished tournament and cash game players. And that, that's really never going to happen again in this big field, big, big tournament thing. But Chris was just sort of dancing through the raindrops, and he won a few hands, and he won a few hands. And with about two tables left, he started accumulating some chips. He was one of the leaders, and people were saying, who is this guy? We don't know anything about him, and mm -hmm. whatever. But everyone sort of figured that he would go by the way of the wind. And as it got down and down, he won the key pot against Phil Ivey and knocked him out when he caught an ace on the last card to make queens full aces. When he flopped three queens, Phil got very lucky and turned to nine. Right. That was a very strange hand, because Jason had two tens that hand, and folded him when, when Moneymaker bet. And then Phil called after Jason and folded the tens right. and uh, then immediately caught a nine had a very big advantage Chris had a seven outer and they put all the money in with one to come and Chris made it on the end so that was the end of Phil and even though Phil was my friend I was so happy Moneymaker won that pot because it was like almost four in the morning right. and for some reason ESPN had decreed because of course ESPN runs all poker <laughs> that uh, they wanted us to play till nine players and we had played 10-handed for like two hours without anybody going broke. Mm -hmm. And we had actually just decided that if no one went broke by 4 o'clock, we were going to just quit and come back with 10 because it was getting insane because they wanted to start at 12 o'clock oh, the yeah, next day. Course. So then even though I didn't really want to see Phil out because he's my friend, I also knew that Phil was like one of the more dangerous guys that oh, was yeah. left. And Moneymaker didn't look that dangerous, even though he had a lot of chips. I figured he'd make a mistake here or there. But it seemed like his mistakes didn't ever cost him, because even if he called your raise with five high, it seems like he made fives up. Right. So, uh, I don't know, maybe five four is a better hand than I know, but uh, he knew, he knew how to work it. He, he won quite a few pots with yeah, he uh, made some very, very unusual hands. And he also made some great plays. He bluffed Sammy a big pot when they were head up, when Sammy had two nines, and was the highest card on the board. He made Sammy lay it down. He did make some good plays. I don't know if he knew they were good plays at the time, yeah. but I'm not saying he didn't either. He, he, I think he was a little better than people gave him credit for, and plus the unknown really worked in his factor that people just didn't know where he was at and stuff, but he sort of changed the face of poker because people saw that anyone could do it, and look what's happened in the last couple of years just with the entries in tournaments and people playing online and so many people on all these sites online, and uh, 
you know, it's really expanded poker because people think that, heck, I don't have to work as an accountant. I can just make a couple million a year playing poker. It's easy. It's really easy. Well, what do you think the poker world would be like had David Gray won the 2003 World Series poker? I think poker probably would have been retired, sort of like, you know, <laughs> lacrosse or something like that. They would have said, oh, if that guy could win, it's not worth playing. I, th- I, it would think just be over. I think you'd see a very different style of play. There wouldn't be so much bluffing and craziness. There'd be people uh, Who was trying waiting to have for a better hand. hands and <laughs> trying to get their money in good instead of saying, well, I can run over these guys. Right. An- another point David brought up, which I think is becoming increasingly important, is saying, well, we had agreed that we were going to quit at four in the morning. And in the final table coming up, my guess is it's going to take a long, long time for somebody to win it. They're going to be playing slowly, carefully. There are a lot of chips in play versus the opening blind structure. They're going to be playing almost for sure 12 hours after they start, and I wouldn't be surprised to see it go even into the high teens or 20 hours after they start, which makes it a stamina contest as much as a poker contest. So you think that's going to be one of the most important factors is just standing up to the amount of time? I mean, there's still got to be some other considerations well, as well. Well, mental pressure as well, right. too. It's really right. not cracking mentally. Uh, there's going to be some bad things that happen to you eventually if you survive. So it's not going to just be all good and all up. Right. You're going to take some, lose some hands, miss flops, have a tough hand beat, etc. And the way that you react with the whole world watching you, it's going to be on pay-per-view, all kinds of radio broadcasts and everything. And there's a lot of money involved now. Even though these guys all have like over a million in the bank, there's a big difference between a million five and 12 million. Right. And people really would like to win that 12 million because there's a lot of other good things that come with 12 million, like internet contracts. And it could be worth for the right person another five to 10 million easily oh, in the man. next two or three more years, that, maybe sure. more depending upon right. who. And, uh, you know, there's really one only experienced player left, Alan, and uh, he's young, he's strong. We know he's not going to run out of gas. Right. I don't think he's going to crack. The question is, will he get cracked? Right. I mean, if things go according to Hoyle, I expect to see Alan in the last two. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a perfect time for us to, to move into our handicapping the final table. And what we like to do always is have everyone try to pick in order. We have some lists down there. But what I'm going to do first for the people who are listening at home who don't know these players and haven't been around for the last week, I'm going to let them all know uh, a little bit about each player, starting with the uh, ninth place player. Uh, and you guys can sound off if you know anything about these guys, which I assume most of them you may not. But uh, Dan Nassif is coming in in ninth place. Uh, his chip count is 2.6 million. He's going to be in the four seed. He has no career results as far as tournaments are concerned from us. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. He's a 2-5 no limit player and a 10-20 no limit player online, as well as playing $200 sit and goes. Does anyone know anything about this Dan Nassif character, other than the fact that he's going in on the short stack? And what does that mean in this in this particular case, do you think, considering the, the caliber of competition that, that we have at the final table in Allen? <laughs> well, I certainly don't know who he is. I mean, to a certain degree, though, I think being the short stack, there's a certain amount of, of lack of pressure. Everyone else is going to come and be very, very tight. I mean, he's going to know, hey, i got to pick up a hand. I'm going to have to just get it in at some point. And, you know, so that, that may alleviate a little bit of the pressure. But um, other than that, you know, I don't know how much it's going to affect him because I didn't have the opportunity to play with Dan at any point, so I'm not sure. Don't know who he is, but nobody likes to come in ninth when they get to the last table. Right. So we know he the is the – uh, I think Howard told me that the, the, the average stack has 70 big blinds, whatever that is. I think it was like 160. It was 8160. I think when they quit yesterday. Mm, 8160. So it's either going to be one and two or 8160. Right. Yeah, so, so if it's one and two, then this guy's going to have to get. He's going to have to get moving pretty quick. Yeah, so it'd be 300 plus probably the, like a 20 ante. Well, he's right. so it's going to be have, 180 and 300, 480 around. He has five rounds of folding, and if he folds two rounds and he doubles up, he's right back where he started with. Right. So I mean, he's really got to find something. But the thing is, he's sort of knowing that there's a reasonable chance he's going to come in ninth. So he might be able to pick up some chips, right. just because no one else wants to go out to the before this guy exactly. because there's like a half a million dollar jump just to the next payoff and I think he actually and the very large stacks are going to have an advantage over the five and six million dollar stacks mm-hmm. right at the beginning they don't want to like take a stand against this guy if he opens and have right. one of the big sacks well, come in over the top of them and then they have to release he may also decide to play very tight and hope he moves up a notch or two notches that just as very a confrontation yeah, and you know possible. an extra half a million or million is you know some people work all week for that right. yeah i just think that the advantage of the really big stacks like kind of like you said over the five millions is is so much more than the advantage of the really big stacks over the one or two millions they're just going to be looser they're going to know they have to get it in well the one or two million guys when they see ace 10 i mean right they Enter the pot and the guy moves in. Yep. They better show him the best hand. They're going to play it. Right. Whereas a guy with five million who comes in for seven hundred thousand and somebody makes a three million more and they have ace right. nine of hearts might say, you know, 
will live to fight another fight, possibly, depending upon who the Oops, guy is or what it is. Right. I'm saying if he has a hand, something like that, and he raises it. Yeah. We're not talking about you, guys. <laughs> you want him to throw away Ace Nine of Hearts? <laughs> I'm not saying that he will. He might. Well, Michael Binger. Michael I mean, no one's throwing away Ace Kings and Ace Queens. We're not talking ridiculous, but <laughs> I have seen people throw away Ace Nine of Hearts and someone raises me like $5 million. Wow. <laughs> Michael Binger from Atherton, California, Nine. is coming in in eighth place. His chip counts $3.1 million, so another short stack. He's in the sixth seat. Apparently, he placed seventh in a $1,500 No Limit event at this World Series of Poker, so not a bad World Series for him. His lifetime winnings are just over 100000 I don't know if anybody played with Michael, but uh, obviously has a little bit of experience now and, and had a decent World Series, so... He's coming in with $3 million. We'll see. Uh, Rhett Butler from Rockville, Maryland, is uh, the nine seed. He has $4.8 million in chips. Uh, no career results for him either. Apparently, he plays 50 and 100 limit online. Has and anyone no said well. his chips are going to be gone with like, the wind? Yeah. <laughs> is that his real name, by the way? It is. Uh, really? Well, I don't know if it is, actually. I guess <laughs> it, we're if, still... If, if Clark Abel shows up at the last table, we'll be a little suspicious. <laughs> right. So, yeah, he's, he's in that sort of range of, of what you guys were just talking about. He has about $5 million in chips. Right. So, what, I mean, you're saying those are going to be the guys with the most pressure, the well, guys the, right in the middle the, there? The, the thing about those guys is they 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 have to play. I mean they they don't have the luxury of not having a lot and being loose. They they could make a, a misstep early and just knock themselves right out of contention. So that's going to be in their head. They're still thinking I can win this thing. I, you know I just need to make a couple hands. I need to make sure I don't misstep. So they're going to be more aware. You know I mean it, it's the burden of having a lot of chips. It's great you want more chips, but there's more pressure on what you do with those chips rather than when you have fewer of them. Does anyone else know anything about this uh, character? I don't really know anybody at the last table <laughs> except for Alan. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's pressure is what you make of it. So right. some people are going to go in there and say, geez, I've already went through all these players. And if I go out now, so what? I'm going to try my best to just win this thing. And other people, you know, the way Joe Hashem played last year, he was very lucky. He mm-hmm. sort of slip slided a lot of danger. He didn't have hands. Guys broke each other. All of a sudden, there was four guys left. He was quite the low guy. Right. And then he won a hand, and he hung in there, and then someone got broke, and then there was three, and he survived, and all of a sudden, he won it. Yeah. And he was a genius. Really, <laughs> really, the only other guy besides Alan who I know is Richard Lee, and I don't really know him. I know of him. He's from Texas. San Antonio, he's, yep. He's a sports better, whatever, gambler sports better, plays in some of the Texas poker games. Oh, he does? Mm-hmm. He's very friendly with Steve Lott. Oh, really? Oh. And uh, well, I think they, they've traded percentages, so I know Steve Lott is rooting very strongly for him. And uh, well, He must be a reasonably good player if Steve Lott would trade percentages with him because Steve Lott is an excellent player. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I would think he's another one of the ones who's a contender. Well, he's uh, he has, he's coming in in third right now in chips with eleven million eight hundred twenty thousand. He's in the one seat, and apparently his lifetime tournament winnings are uh, pretty much one cash in the Larry Flint's Grand Slam of Poker, twelfth place, fifty six hundred. Mm-hmm. Going back though, uh, our sixth place. Uh, coming in in sixth place in chips is Doug Kim from Hartsdale, New York. He has six point seven million. He's in the seventh seat. Uh, no career results from him, but he is friends with uh, Jason Strasser. Uh, he plays online three six and five ten no limit on uh, party, and I think he's a, a pretty young guy. So perhaps the stamina factor will will help for him. Paul Wasica, though, I think is interesting. Is an interesting guy to look at because he had a good finish here at the WPT Championship. He came in. Uh, I believe it's 15th place at WPT Championship this year. He has seven. He has almost eight million in chips. Seven point nine million in chips. He's in the three seat. He's won over 200 uh, 200 thousand in lifetime tournament earnings. Also has two caches this World Series. So a 12th in the 5K no limit and a 14th in the 5K. Mm-hmm. So this is for, it looks like this is the first time he's really cracked the final table in a major event. Um, so, but I think he might be somebody to watch right. to at least move up a couple places. Whether or not he can overcome the huge chip lead and Alan Cunningham above him is is a different story. But I think he, he might be one to watch to to move up a few places for uh-huh. sure. Again, I'd advise anyone who's watching on pay-per-view, try and focus on Alan Cunningham and what he does because he's a true, true talent at poker. I mean, he's had a terrific tournament record, and he's one of the guys who can win in cash games too, which is always... There are some people who can do one and not the other, and mm-hmm. he's capable of doing both and plays really super poker. How sick is that too, that he could actually win Player of the Year for the World Series two years in a row? I mean, that's, that's I think incredible. if he comes in second or better, he wins, right? Yeah. I thought he had to win, but... Oh, maybe he has to win. I don't know. I know he, won, he won a tournament this year. But, and I mean, this is great. This, this tournament's got to come for a little something. <laughs> you, one would think. <laughs> 
So uh, Eric Freiberg is coming in in fourth place. He has almost $10 million, $9.6 million. He is from Stockholm, Sweden, a semi-pro gambler. He's in the two seed. He plays, I guess, up to 1,500 pot limit Omaha, wow. mostly online. Uh, so that's where he's coming from. Uh, we t- a, l- a lot of the Danes and Swedes, who I guess the all night uh, when they have nothing else to do in the land of the midnight sun, they're, uh, <laughs> they're playing poker online, and a lot of them are very good now. Yeah. He, he could actually be. Are, are these guys, most of them, do we know if, if any of these guys are older? Or are they all like young Well, Eric, Eric Freiberg is also 23 years old. Oh, so really? he, he has a, uh, a a leg up in the stamina competition as well. Because Alan's like 29. Right. right. I don't know. And the, the guy who's the leader is about 37 so or 8. I know Jimmy that. Jimmy Gold is 36. Right. Yeah. I think there's only, there's only one gentleman who's a little bit older. Alan's, oh, really? Alan's, like one, of the, Alan's one of the old boys at the table. I know. Huh? 29. <laughs> all right, guys. We are going to take a break. When we get back, we'll finish handicapping this World Series Booker final table with David Gray and Steve Zolotow right here on The Circuit. Ever dreamed of attending the Super Bowl? Or maybe your dream is to attend Golf's The Masters. Or maybe you're even like Joe Seabock and would like to attend the Polar Penguin Sumo Championships. Whatever your dream sporting event is, Card Player would like to help you get there. If you subscribe now to Card Player Magazine at the new low price of $19.99, you'll be entered into our special World Series of Poker subscription contest for a trip for two to any sporting event anywhere in the world. All right, we have someone else in the studio now. Barry Greenstein wants to help us handicap these final two. How's it going? Uh, no, that wasn't why I threw up here. showed up here. I saw you guys huddled in the corner. I was just curious what was going on. I, <laughs> can't can't you guys get a regular studio to do this? <laughs> now you've been dragged I th- into I it. I think Barry saw David and I sitting at the same table and said, if there's a seat open, I'm sitting down. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, if Z's in the game, it's a good game. I have nothing against Z. He's just good at game selection. <laughs> and he knows if I'm around, he'll get to eat good. That's right. David, uh, David definitely knows what to order. Well, we're, right. down to the, we're down to the final two here, handicapping can, the final table we, tomorrow. Can we oh, wait. go back to uh, that previous comment for one second about how old the players were? Sure. Does anyone know what the age distribution of people entering the tournament was? Because everyone keeps saying about how many young people there are at the mm-hmm. final table. But you wonder, well... Were there a whole bunch of old people who've already been knocked out, or is it just there were so many well, young three kids playing old. now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're older than almost all the I field. Think, I think yeah. at this point the field is getting younger, and even you know not only in average age but just in bulk. I mean, well, of course, bulk, you yeah. know most I, of the. Players. I would guess two percent were under twenty-one and use someone else's idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know the oldest player was Victor Golden, ninety-one years old. He right. is not at the final table, however. So, and it might have been tough for him with the stamina thing. It yeah, might have been, it may have, killed it might have been his final table. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are on the final two. We hope not, though, Victor. We'll see you next year. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) <laughs> You're evil. <laughs> Sorry. Alan Cunningham is coming in in second ship position with 17.7 million. I know all the other guys, but who's he? <laughs> in the five seat from Ventura, California. Now, uh, obviously a laundry list of uh, accomplishments for Alan. Four-time World Series of Poker bracelet winner. Uh, two no-limit bracelets already. One this year. Uh, $2.3 million in lifetime earnings at the series. $4.3 million total in lifetime tournament earnings. 23 cash at the series. And obviously leaps and bounds above the field and experience and uh, you know poker knowledge and results uh, and I guess apparently he's been heads up 23 times and won 15 of those heads up matches I don't know if that's an impressive percentage as far as tournaments are concerned or not that's pretty impressive uh, you guys I would, would probably say. tell me uh, well, it, well it random is. would be 12 and 11 so and, it's a little and, better than average and of course we don't know what the chip amounts were yeah. when he got to that thing so you might uh, it, it, you know, he may have been under chip by the time he got there a lot of times, right. too. So is he pretty much, the, is it across the board agreed that he is the favorite at this final table? Well, David and I bet against him. <laughs> Nothing personal, but we got to bet almost even when he was a 4-1 to chip dog. So and by we, the way, on we, Pinnacle, he was 4-1 to favorite over uh, over Allen that night. I looked at it. He had to lay 4-1 to and take like 360 with uh, Allen to finish ahead of Jamie Gold at that time. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we laid 6-5. to five. Yeah, As we all know, <laughs> at, at some point it did. Almost does just come down to who has the most chips. We're not at that point yet, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, if, if they wait, you know, a couple hours into the match, if Jamie's still got him out chip, Jamie definitely is going to be the favorite. And one of the other things that uh, you know, I assume you guys have discussed. Everybody at this point has seen the reports with Jamie with Queen Six of Diamonds and Seven Eight right. Clubs and calling those hands, and and it's obviously the thing. So people know Jamie's been in there a little while. Probably the other guys are like eight guys who have been gambling a little little more than uh, average and have gotten lucky to get there but as it gets more shorthanded and jamie continues to have the big stack he becomes a really scary guy you know you you don't like 
when you're out chip playing against unpredictable people. Well, it's kind of interesting that you bring that up. I mean, would you say that it might make because normally I would think if you have chips at this point, you want to be a battering ram. But it's I would think that these other guys are going to start to play with him now. Seeing the queen six, the queen six is the hand that that I certainly you know paid attention to. Well, you know, this is such a big platform. The the final of uh, the the final table of the main event of the World Series poker. It's pressure on everyone. Uh, you know, Alan, of course, knows more than the rest of them probably what it means historically. But there's pressure on every person. And anyone, uh, uh, you know, and several of us here have gotten at some point to their first televised final table. I sucked at mine. And the first <laughs> thought you have, frankly, is I don't want to look like an idiot. On My TV. family's going to be watching. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't want to do anything stupid. That's the first thought. Actually, it was that thought that allowed me to win my first one because... Just because of my experience as a poker player, my second reaction was, hey, I bet everyone else is having that same thought. Right. You know, Normally the way you do things in poker is you first know what you think, and you know other people are thinking the same thing. And once I had that thought, I said, well, and they're going to be tightened up by it. I've got to now react in a different way, and I've got to start running over them, and that's what I did. And it's uh, it's like you know the old thing of the, the three wise men with the dirt on their forehead type of thing. Who is going to make the right adjustment? Because some of the people are tightened up. Well, we all know who's going to make an immediate adjustment. That's Alan Cunningham. Alan Cunningham has been there. He knows that. He knows how people are going to feel in this particular situation. That does give him a big advantage. And, and, and he may get the jump on people. I wouldn't be surprised because of his experience. See, the other people kind of waiting for the short stack to get knocked out. Alan, meanwhile, is raising in the cut off and one to the right of that and on the button t- picking things up and before you know it Alan has the chip lead and people are not oh best player's got the chip lead and mm-hmm. they start playing for second it could easily happen well and another thing that happens when there's a player let's say like Jamie Gold or someone you think is very loose and maybe in there with inadequate values you say but yeah, even a loose player sometimes picks up a real hand. This might be the time he's got the nuts. Am I really going right. to tap out, you know, making a fool of myself with my king high, hoping he has queen high? All right. Well, I, I had a very similar scenario at, at my first uh, table. I was telling you, it was the Tunica. We had Randy Jensen, who is probably <laughs> as similar to Jamie Gold from what we've seen. Uh, you know, Randy's a real wild cannon, did a lot of Jamie Gold nothing. cubed. Yeah, you know, Jamie right. Gold. And the fact is, he, he had gotten his chips, he had bluffed people out of hands, he'd done all these things. And what happened was, when he got to that televised final table, which I assume was his first also, things changed. You know, all of a sudden, he went into the tight mode. He didn't want to go out and be the chip leader, go out early. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you don't know till you're there how it's going to affect people. And all of us who've been there know it does have an effect. And so, uh, you know, he could now change, you know, he could change, change his game plan, which will work out well if he picks up some big hands because he'll get action on them. But, uh, you know, most of what I've seen, and uh, you guys, I'm sure, have seen more than me, it has been his what we know is actually he's been calling with questionable hands, right. which is uh, often a bigger sin than raising with questionable hands. Raising with questionable hands makes it hard to play a guy with a lot of chips. Calling with questionable hands makes you Gavin Smith. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Jamie Gold, just to give people out there a little history on him, 36 years old from Malibu, California. He's a Team Bodog member, I guess. Uh, seat. Yeah, he's in the eighth seat with twenty six point six million. He had over thirty at one point yesterday. Right. Uh, I guess he was a, a somewhat of a protege of Johnny Chan. He mentioned he worked on a television project with him, and Johnny uh, taught him the ropes a bit. So uh, I guess he he has some experience working with a professional poker player on his game. Um, he's an ex Hollywood agent turned uh, TV producer, and his uh, this is his only cash ever in World Series history. But he does have Let's a, make fir- it a good one. Uh, yeah. First at <laughs> first at the Stars and Stripes at the bike for fifty four thousand in 05 and a second at the Sport of Kings at the Hollywood Park Casino this April for 18400 So, That's not bad. N- some decent results for Jamie Gold. Plus we don't know how much he's played, so that might be actually excellent well, results. Right. Also, if you believe in names, you know, Moneymaker won it with a name like Moneymaker. <laughs> this guy's name is Gold, and he's going for the gold. So, you know, you might say, well, that's karmic. Uh, and one thing that people listening out there should be perfectly clear of, because we've never heard of these guys, doesn't mean they aren't good players. We know right. Alan is a good player. Right. I've played hundreds of hours with Alan. He's had great tournament success. He's played very high cash games and won for a period of years. I know Alan is a terrific player. I don't know that these people are terrific players, but they could very well mm-hmm. be two or three players better than Alan here. You know, you know, actually, one huh. of the things uh, very often. It's possible. <laughs> very well three. I don't know if there's very well three players no, in the I didn't world. Say, no, no, he's I saying, didn't saying it's say not beyond the It's not impossible that you know, this is like two years from now, you'll I mean, say, remember Jamie Gold a couple years ago? He's won every tournament. Yeah, you know, you know but, I mean, it, it, it could be that these are really good players, too. Other than Barry Greenstein and David Gray, I mean, 
who really yeah, is right. better than yeah, Ron right. Cunningham. No, at the beginning, <laughs> at the beginning of the of the tournament, oh I, I often get interviewed by ESPN, and they ask me, you know, who do you think the favorites are? And what I tell them is, some young player who's a good player, but we don't know. Who that means we're going to play badly against him because he's going to be doing things that we're not capable. Everyone here, you know, Gavin, David, uh, Steve, Joe, myself, not Scott, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, everyone here, if we play against someone, they actually have kind of a line on what we're capable of doing. They've not only seen us on TV, but just by virtue of the fact that they know we're experienced players. They know we're going to bluff a certain frequency of time, you know. And so it, it helps them out to play us. You get some guy who's just been playing on the Internet or even playing in live games, but people don't know who he is, that definitely gives them an edge. Because normally what happens, uh, you know, like if I play one of those guys early on, a lot of times I'll say, well, I don't want to commit myself against this guy. I want to see more of his play. I may lay down a hand, and later I find out the guy's a total lunatic. Right, until you know, that he, until you yeah. figure out he's a total and lunatic. So, so these guys could, you know, really if they're good players, in some sense, even chips, they might be slight favorites against a guy like Allen until he figures them out. Mm. And I, we know I Allen's also, a terrific player, but there yeah. probably are other guys but that the, are pretty I, good here. I yeah. also always judged inexperienced players by how they handle the chips, but now with the internet, that's not yeah, a good course. clue. Yeah, there yeah, are yeah. a lot of people who fumble with the chips right. and they're can't make change, right. yeah. but they've been no, playing online since they were 11 years old, right. and they're superstars technically. I yeah. can do tons of chip tricks, but I'm a horrible well, poker player. If, <laughs> if you, just, you know, I misclick at least once a day when I play online because I don't play that much, so if they judge me by that... Uh, well, you're a donkey. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, well, we're running short on time, so we're going to do this, starting with Joe Seabock and just move around the table in one word, or I guess two words, a name. Who do you predict to win the 2006 World Series of Poker Main Event Championship? You know, I'd like to go out on a limb, but it's it's hard to pick against Allen. I mean, I'm gonna see I'm gonna say Allen or Jamie. Just Jamie by by virtue of the fact that he has so many chips, and Alu Allen by virtue of the fact that we uh, think he has such an edge and experience in play. All right, Steve Z. Well, seeing as I have a bet with David Gray where I need another bracelet by the uh, team full tilt, I have to root for Allen and pick Allen both to uh, bring home my money. David? Fingers, I'm betting against Allen. I'm going to pick Allen. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't think it's inconceivable that anyone left could win, without a doubt. It'll be very difficult for the very lowest stacks to win, but not impossible. But anyone in the middle could just sort of hang in, hang in, double up one time, and he's right there. Be four guys left. They could all have $20 million and uh, it's a complete crapshoot. Also, also, you'll find that the good players like to feel that being a good player is worth something, so they'll always pick a good player over perhaps the chip leader or the biggest gambler. No, I think without a doubt that the Jamie Gold clearly has at least as good a chance as Allen, I really do, just by his chips. And he obviously did something to get those chips. He wasn't just completely lucky. He probably did a lot of good things also. I mean, it's like six days of sliding through the raindrops, so... You know, he, I don't think he flopped two pair every hand for six days. Gavin Smith? Uh, I also have a bet and need Allen Cunningham to win. So these I'll these pick, guys are uh, always betting against Allen. So I'll pick Jimmy Gold. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know, I, I uh, as you know, I, I, Dave and I have the same bet, at least on one of them, where I had Jamie Gold when he had Allen 4-1. to one. But what I'm afraid of, if I don't pick Allen... Uh, I will have to withstand the, the wrath of Melissa Hayden. <laughs> and that is worth, far worse. That Alan, is, that is not worth more than money. That's right. Alan <laughs> is as calm as they get. You know, Alan is, is really a great guy. One of the good things, you know, I've, uh, Alan would be a great representative. We've been really fortunate, uh, frankly. The last few unknown winners have all been really good guys and good representatives of poker. And uh, Alan, uh, as a known player, we all know he's a good guy and would be a good representative. Little Huck Seed like that he's a little bit quiet, but he'd be a good guy. Um, he's tall and thin. Jamie mm-hmm. Gold, the, from the few things I heard him call on your radio show, seems like a nice guy. Seems I don't like a doubt, very nice guy. Yeah, I don't doubt that he'd be a good representative also. So it looks like we're in good standing there. But Melissa scares me. So <laughs> oh, Alan Alan. Yeah. See, I'm, gonna, I'm actually afraid that if Alan, I think Alan would be a great representative, but I feel like he, if he does win, he's going to end up going and living under a bridge because he's so, you know, attention phobic and everyone's so aware of that. He never doesn't like to do interviews. He doesn't like to have all the attention. He With $12 million, dollars, he won't have to live under a bridge, though. He can probably buy it'll be, a nice It'll house. be a nice bridge. I got news it'll be a golden <laughs> bridge. Under a bridge already. He'll, he'll own the bridge. That's yeah, the yeah. good thing. It, 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 right. it will certainly be Cunningham Square in between, you know, Absolutely. two bodies of law. He'll be charging the toll going and coming. Right. Well, uh, we are out of time. Uh, my pick, if anyone cares, is going to be Paul Wasica. Good pick. Good <laughs> That's pick. what I'm taking. Is he Thank still you. in? Uh, he is still in. All right. Go, Paul. Still in. Steve, David, Barry, thanks a lot for coming in and doing this with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. You're Thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Stephanie Laramore, Playboy Playmate, Miss June 2006. 
Do you want to play naked with me? Naked poker, that is. Log on to NakedPoker.com and you will automatically be entered into a free tournament where the winner takes me, Stephanie Laramore, Miss June 2006, Playboy Playmate, out on a private date. Log on to NakedPoker.com now to enter and win. I love playing naked. Naked poker, that is. I'm Howard Letterer and I'm a member of Team Full Tilt. If you want to learn, chat, and play with me and other team members like Phil Ivey and Chris Ferguson, join us at Full Tilt Poker. Com. Welcome back to the circuit, everyone. We are broadcasting on Sports Byline Radio on Sirius Channel 122, on CardPlayer.com, and on the iTunes Music Store as a podcast. Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach. Wow, is all I can say to that. It was like the genius triumvirate. The genius triumvirate. Yep. And Joe Seabach. Yeah, and then me trying to desperately me, to, um, to hold them up. <laughs> I love the I love the barrier to go. Well, not well, not you, Scott, because you're 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 a donkey. Yeah, well, not you, Scott. <laughs> thanks. What thanks, is your Barry. daddy do day? <laughs> Here we go. If you want to become as good as Barry Greenstein, David Gray, or perhaps Steve Zolotow, uh, Card Player Poker would like to help you become a better player and reward you with three thousand dollars in prize money every month for playing in our free rolls. It's as simple as signing up, and it's free to everyone. All you need to do is check out www.cardplayer.com slash free poker. Register for the free roll, download the client, get in the game today, and win your share of three Gs. Did you know I can play in that actually as a bounty and they'll give people a subscription, but I just haven't had a chance to. And we all know I'm a monster in the free rolls. If, if, uh, if Gavin and I play, do, can we get bounties as well? Yeah, absolutely. What will the bounty be? I'm sure the bounty would be the same thing. Which is? A subscription to the person who knocked you out. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I wouldn't if you mind feel like playing in a free roll. I mean, I, I don't feel like playing in a free roll, but... Well, but you could do it just yeah. to have maybe, people maybe, interact. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. All right. We'd like to thank our guests today, Steve Zolotow, David Gray, Barry Greenstein. I'd like to thank you guys for a great job there handicapping the final table as well. And you can look for Gavin on pay-per-view tomorrow during the final table. He will be there doing the final table with Phil Gordon. So check that out and make sure you check us out again tomorrow on the circuit. Enjoy the final table, everybody. Goodbye. Later. Later.